Well, hey there, everyone. I'm Daniel Hahn, and I'm the online campus pastor here at Oxford Assembly of God Church, and this is our podcast. And I just want to thank you for listening today. We hope the message you're about to hear inspires you, builds your faith, and helps you see that God has a purpose for your life. And now, let's get into the message. Three or four weeks ago, I gave Daniel a shock. I sent him the title of three of my messages because you say, well, what's so shocking about that? Because usually he messaged me on Thursday. What's the title of your message? I said, I don't know. I'm still working on it. So, well, several weeks ago, I was given the three messages to, uh, over, over Easter. And two weeks ago, I preached about the miracle of the resurrection of Lazarus and emphasize that the miracle of resurrection of Lazarus was the beginning of the end because that triggered the domino effect to get Jesus to the cross. And then last week, and even though we had our, a great concert by Larry Ford, I preached a, a, a short message on it is finished. The earthly ministry of Jesus finished on the cross. When I say Jesus, I'm talking about the man Jesus. It was finished. And today, of course, we celebrate the resurrected Savior. We celebrate the empty tomb. But the empty tomb was not the end. It was the beginning. Not the end, but the beginning. In the book, the case for Easter, Lee Strobel makes this statement. In the face of facts, they have been impotent to put Jesus' body back in the tomb. They flounder, they struggle, they snatch at straws, they contradict themselves, they pursue desperate and extraordinary extraordinary theories to try to account for the evidence. Yet each time, in the end, the tomb remains vacant. The tomb remains vacant. Praise God, the tomb is still empty. Give the Lord a hand. Jesus still lives. Life did not end at the tomb. Eternal life began at the tomb. The tomb was not, was empty. It is empty. It is empty. And as I was praying, I told you God gave me the title. He just didn't give me the message. But as I was looking, say, God, what, what do you mean the tomb was the beginning Well, there's two very similar phrases in the Bible. There's the phrase, the living God. How many knows we serve a living God? But then there's also the phrase, the God of the living. That God is the God of the living. He is not dead. He's alive. He's a God of new beginnings. I said, the God of new beginnings. At the first Passover, before they left Egypt, God told him, said, okay, we're going to change the calendar. That from now on, Passover is at the beginning. The beginning, the first month. We're changing it. And the last Passover, now I know we celebrate the Passover every time we take of communion, but the last actual Passover was when Jesus shared it with his disciples. And he says, every time you do it, you're remembering this Passover. You're remembering this one. So as I looked at those phrases that He's the living God and the God of the living. I found one in a book that 
I really was not expecting it. Because generally, whenever I come together, how many of you are expecting me to start in Luke today? The one you're looking for is not here, he's risen. That's a good place to preach an Easter message. But I found a scripture and a book that I'd never thought about being an Easter message. It's the book of Hosea. I know some of you said, I'm going to be interested and see how you work that in. But look with me in Hosea chapter 1. Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. Remember, that's a promise that he gave to Abraham. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. Who was speaking this? This is God. He said, I'm going to say, you're not my people. It shall be said to them, children of the living God. Children of the living God. That intrigued me. You shall not be my people, but rather the children of the living God. How did this tie in? How did this fit in? Well, to understand, we have to go back a bit, and we must realize that Hosea was written well before the book of Isaiah. I said it was written before the book of Isaiah. Matter of fact, if you go over to 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 3, when Jehoazaz was reigned in Israel, notice what it says in verse 3. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them continually into the hand of Hazio, king of Syria, and into the hand of Benadad, the son of Hazio. Then Jehoazaz sought the favor of the Lord. Aren't you glad when people start looking for God, they find him? He sought the favor of the Lord, and the Lord listened to him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, how the king of Syria oppressed them. Therefore, the Lord gave Israel a savior. Now, that savior was not talking about Jesus. It's talking about this king that was going to redeem them, that was going to spare them from the hand of the Syrians, and the people of Israel lived in their homes as formerly. Now, that's a great promise. God raised up somebody that's going to deliver them. Nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin, but walked in them, and the Asherah also remained in Samaria. This was the setting of when the book of Hosea was written. The nation was in a downward spiral, and they were ignoring God. Does that sound familiar? They were ignoring God. And God raised up a man by the name of Hosea. It's kind of interesting because you know what Hosea means? It means deliverer. The name Hosea means deliverer. And if you know the Bible, if you've read the book of Hosea, you know that it's a very vivid picture. A illustrated sermon. That's what it was. It was an illustrated sermon to the nation of Israel. And he said, Hosea, I want you to go take a wife of whoredom. Let's read it. Hosea chapter 1 verse 2. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, The Lord said to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom for the land commits great whoredom for forsaking the Lord. This was the setting. One king had risen to the front. He tried to get them revived, but they ignored it and they continued to sin and even used the word Asherah. Now that was they worshiped at the Asherah pole. That was a, a place of orgy. Then they also worshiped Molech. That was a a God that they offered children sacrifices, babies. Now I know, I hear it said often, the world has never been as bad as it is today. It was pretty bad back then. I mean, we kill babies, but I haven't seen them offered as sacrifices. 
But it was, it was bad. And so God told Hosea, I want to make a picture. And I want you to have children out of whoredom. Now, what exactly does that mean? That means, listen, you're going to have children, but won't be sure they're yours. A picture. Three children were born. Now, we can't spend a lot of time here. But three children. First one was a son, Jezreel. Jezreel means scattered by God. One definition is God sows. But how many knows that it was coming up before long that the nation of Israel would be taken away through the great exodus? Hosea was written before Isaiah. It was written before Daniel. And the children of Israel would be scattered. That's a picture. The next child would be a daughter, Lo Rahoma, which means no mercy, or no compassion. No grace, no love. He said, this is coming. This is coming. And then the third child was Loami, which is, comes to that verse that we read. You are not my people. But let me remind you that God was not divorcing them. They had already divorced God. They had left God out of the picture. This was roughly 25 years prior to Isaiah. Isaiah. Israel had been in a downward spiral for over a century. Over 100 years, they'd been in a downward spiral. But God did, did not want Israel to continue, so he sent this picture. A harsh picture. A vivid picture. You're committing spiritual adultery. Now, since it was brought to my attention, I've been intrigued by the fact that the Jews consider the giving of the Ten Commandments on the mountain by, to Moses as a marriage covenant. Think about it. A marriage covenant when he gave them the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other God's before me. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But it was a covenant between Israel and God. But Israel had been unfaithful. And I know some of you say, well, Pastor, that's good thoughts, but how does that tie in with Easter? It ties in with Easter because Easter was not the end, it was the beginning. See, our faith is dependent upon the empty tomb. The empty tomb signifies a new beginning. Just 50 days after that Passover, when Jesus offered himself on the cross, was what? The day of Pentecost. In the upper room, the church was born. And what is the church? The bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. Now go with me over to the book of Jeremiah and see something. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1. The words, or excuse me, chapter 2, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord. I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness and a land not sown. What's he saying? Jeremiah was written for Isaiah as well. And he told Jeremiah, he said, I want you to tell the people, the people in Jerusalem, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a what? As a bride. How the nation of Israel followed the bridegroom, God, out of Egypt into the promised land. You followed him as a bride. But then it goes on to say, Israel 
was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of the harvest. The first fruits of the harvest. Now, many of us can quote John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, they gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But we might not can quote later on in that chapter down at verse 28. John the Baptist was speaking this. John the Baptist spoke this. He says, you yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. John the Baptist. I've been sent by God before Jesus. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this is the joy of mine is now complete. Putting it in our language, he said, I'm not the bridegroom, I'm the best man. I'm getting you ready for the bridegroom. I'm getting you ready to accept Jesus. And he said, man, my life is complete because I get that opportunity to present the bride to the bridegroom. Then he says, I must increase, or he must increase, I must decrease. decrease. And I'm going to say, well, what, what, what about Easter? Where are we getting there? Let me just ask you this. Do you think that the book of Hosea is depicting the fact that Israel was forfeiting God's love, God's mercy, and God's compassion? Don't you think that's what he was saying? You're forfeiting it. That was the whole picture. God wants to love you. He wants to nurture you. He wants to take care of you. He wants to be faithful to you. But do you think it could be possible today that the world in general and the church specifically may be forfeiting God's love, God's passion, God's mercy, God's grace, God's forgiveness? Now, I know some of you have said it because I have. I said, man, it's it's terrible that Israel rejected the Messiah. Don't you think that's bad? They rejected the Messiah. But what did Hosea say? He says, you are not my people. Who was he talking to? Talking to the Jews. Now, I know some of you will want to get into the argument that the Jews are still God's people. They are. But he's telling them they had forsaken him. The Jews are not my people. But it will be said that these are the children of the living God. That could not be true if we did not have a living Savior. It could not be true if we did not have a resurrected God. How often did Jesus tell those around him, I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living that's declared in Matthew Mark and Luke God of the living now let's go over to the book of Romans the book of Romans look at chapter 9 verse 25 and guess who he quotes as indeed he says in Hosea Those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. Now, who's he talking to? See, remember that after the church was born on the day of Pentecost, almost everybody, if not everybody, in there were Jews. But right after that, the Jews totally, basically rejected Jesus. And the great majority of the church were what? Gentiles. And in the very place where it said to them, you're not my people, for they will be called sons of the living God. 
sons of the living God. Not a dead God, but a living God. In other words, we serve a resurrected Savior that the empty tomb was not the end. It was the beginning. It's the beginning of a new life. As many as received him. Who's the him? Jesus Christ. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now the the truth is this, and we don't like to hear it because a lot of people say, well, I never would reject Jesus. I just didn't accept him. If you don't accept him, if any of you guys remember when you were trying to get somebody to go to your prom with you, if they just turned around and walked off, how many knows that was rejection? <laughs> they, might, they, they might not have said, no way, Jose. They might not have said that. They just turned around. They rejected you. Well, when you do not receive Christ, that's rejecting him. If you haven't received him. But if you have, he's made us what? Not just my people. But the sons of God. The sons of God. Now, what else? Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. And you show that you are a letter. King James says living epistle. From Christ, delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone. Up on the mountain they wrote it on tablets of stone. But on tablets of what? human hearts, such as the confidence that we have in Christ toward a God. Not that we're sufficient in ourselves to claim anything. Let me say that again. Not that we're sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming for us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, what does the letter represent? The law. It kills, but the Spirit gives life. So the resurrected Savior gives us a hope and that we have a future, not the end, but it's the beginning. It's not on the tablets of stone, but the tablets of a human heart. Now let's go over to chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 16, and notice something. Where it says, What agreement has the temple of God with idols. For we are the temple of the living God. Now I realize this is a beautiful church God has blessed us with, but I've got news for you. This is not his temple. This excites me every time I think about it. I remember them building the tabernacle and it was a magnificent, beautiful thing. But God said, that's not good enough. And they made the temple the most extravagant building probably ever built. And you know what God said? That's not good enough. He said, I'm going to build something better. And we're going to call it the church. And it's not going to be a building. It's going to be the Spirit of God living in man. That we're going to be part of the living family of God. We are his people. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God says, I will make my dwelling among you, among them, and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch not unclean thing. Then I will will welcome you, and I will be a father to you. Oh, I love this. I'll be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So the empty cross, empty tomb rather, was not the end. It was the beginning that we become children of God. Now, what did Paul say to his son in the faith? Timothy. Well, it says this, 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, 
you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believing on the world, taken up in the glory because the empty tomb was the beginning of a new life in Christ. In the next letter, Paul wrote to Timothy. What did he say? He said, I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. But he didn't stop there. Why? Why? Because the empty tomb. Because the empty tomb was not the end. It was the beginning. He was able to say this. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Those that loved his appearing. Did you catch that phrase, the righteous judge? I've never had to stand before a judge on my own. I've been in courtrooms where I've seen other people stand before a judge. And I can tell you, I really don't want to stand before a judge that don't know all the facts. I know they've heard it all, whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. How many knows that sometimes that's not always the truth? And how many knows that that judge is just human? He's not able to judge the intent of the heart. Does not know what your intentions were. But there is a God judge that we're all going to stand before. And he's the righteous judge. Look what it says in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God, I like that, but God. How many has ever had a but God situation in your life? That looked bad, but God raised him on the third day and made him appear, not to all the people, but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Wow. Forgiveness of sins because we are going to be judged by a righteous judge. Go over to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28. Hebrews 10, 28. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? Wow. Outraged the Spirit of grace? Isn't that a little bit what God was telling Hosea? No more grace, no more mercy, no more compassion because you pushed it aside. You refused to accept it. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And most of us don't like this next verse. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
Wow. We need to realize that we're going to stand before a righteous good judge. And I want to tell you something. We're all guilty. You say, why would you say that? Because the book says it. The Bible says, if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of it all. So let, me, so let me just either encourage you or burst your bubble. You're not going to be good enough to get into heaven. I said, you're not going to be good enough to get in heaven. Because we stand before a righteous judge. And we're all guilty. But those that have accepted Jesus, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And therefore, all of our guilt has been expunged. I think that's the right word. It's been removed. It's been gone. We're innocents. For believer, yes, the word believer is the key. Because if you drop down to the last verse of chapter 10, it says, but we're not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Then it goes into chapter 11, the faith chapter. We often start at verse 6, but I want to back up to verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he could not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Now, Enoch was Noah's great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather. And I know we always already commented on how sinful the world is today. Think about Noah's day. They had to look a long way to find one family. They were all partying, all drinking, being merry, nothing wrong with those things. But they had totally ignored God. They pushed God to the side. They rejected God. Now, I grew up in the Assemblies of God, and I I heard all my life about that unpardonable sin, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And I I was taught this because we said something wrong about the Holy Spirit, or we laughed at the Holy Spirit. Folks, if that was the case, although most of those people on the day of Pentecost got saved, wouldn't have made it. Because when it first happened, what did they say? These people are drunk. So what does blaspheme of the Holy Spirit? It's rejecting the invitation to receive Jesus. And if we, re- if we reject that invitation, we made his dying on the cross wasted. No wonder that's the only unforgivable sin because we refuse that. Now get back to Enoch said, Enoch, walk with God. Now, a lot of people, you know, we don't have any idea what made him stand out as far as his actions. The only thing we know that he'd been commended. He'd been talked about. I don't know about that Enoch. He's kind of weird. He trusts in God. He had faith in God. And we don't even have any record of his family believing except his great-grandson, great-great-grandson, Noah. They rejected it. But what does it say? By faith, Enoch was taken up. And then it says in verse 6, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. You're not going to be good enough. We might as well, you might as well get that out. You're not going to be good enough. I'm not good enough. I learned a long time ago not to worry about trying to be good enough because I'd work my silly fingers to the bone and all I get is bloody fingers. Because works won't get it. What gets it is a realization that the empty tomb was not the end. 
it was the beginning. Up from the grave he arose, a mighty triumph o'er his foes, and he gives us victory, not because of how good we can be, or what the name is of the church we attend, or what church we might be a member of. What gets us saved is the fact that we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and knowing that that tomb is empty, not full. Give the Lord a hand, would you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm glad that I don't have to earn my way to heaven. I'm glad that I don't have to buy my way into heaven. God has blessed my wife and I, but I, I can't even, used to, I could say, you know, when my wife and I started out, we had nothing and we got most of it left. <laughs> but God has blessed us. But I tell you what, I couldn't buy a ticket in heaven. I don't have that much money. All I can do is trust in the one that rose from the empty tomb. And if you haven't done that, friend, you're going to stand before a righteous judge. A righteous judge. He's not going to accuse you of doing anything you didn't do. But we've done enough to keep us out of heaven. But as many has received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for your grace, your mercy, your compassion. I can't imagine, Father, a world or life without that. I need your love. I long for your presence. I'm so glad I'm a part of your body of Christ, that I'm your son, not just your people. I'm your son. So, Father, we ask you to minister by your power, minister by your strength and your anointing. And if there are any today, whether they're watching online or here in this service or be watching in the future, God, that you would let them realize the only way into heaven is not through being good, but just believing in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and repenting of our sins and giving our life to him. God, we ask that if any of those here today are watching, that they would make that decision in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. On behalf of our pastor and staff here at OAG, we want to say thank you. Thank you for being a part of our ministry. We are grateful for you and the support you give our church and its ministries so that we can continue to do what God has called us to do to be the family church for the family of God. For more content from Pastor Strickland and Oxford Assembly of God, check out our media website at oag.church/media.